Thank you all for coming. This is a great turnout for opening of a new exhibit, which is always exciting for us. Welcome. This is our sneak peek program, and it's for this new exhibit, which is called Yosemite 1938, On the Trail with Ansel Adams and Georgia O'Keefe. I'm Jane Lovino, the selected family curator of education and exhibits here at the museum. And this exhibit, if you're just entering, which I, I imagine you all are for the very first time, is a uh, is a, group, a fabulous one we're excited about. It documents a memorable camping trip with Ansel Adams, the photographer, and a group of his good friends. And you're going to be hearing a lot more about that. The exhibit officially opens tonight with our mixed media program that starts at 6 p.m. So there are all kinds of uh, exciting things happening there, including some pack tours of this exhibit. If you want to come back, it goes from 6 to 9, and it's free. Uh, we typically offer, some of you know this, these sneak peek programs right before an exhibit opens officially to the public. And we find that people really enjoy seeing behind the scenes and getting to hear from a few experts and get the inside scoop right before it opens. So after we're done here today, the exhibit, maybe the doors will close, maybe they'll stay open. It's pretty much in place. Sometimes yeah. there are additional things we still need to do after these programs, but this one is pretty much good to go, I think. So we might just keep it open to the public after this. I want to say how grateful we are to our summer exhibit sponsors, including Peregrine Capital Management. And we also would like to recognize and thank journalist Erica Dalby, who is here today and who did a beautiful job on the exhibition article in the Jackson Hole News and Guide. Thank you. Uh, to start today's program, Dr. Adam Harris, our Peterson Family Curator of Art and Research, will begin with an overview of the exhibit. And then after Adam is finished, we'll welcome a special guest, Betsy Grandy, who will talk for about 20 minutes. Thank you, Adam. Okay. I'll just say a few brief words about uh, the exhibit and uh, how we got it and who was on this remarkable trip. Uh, Ansel Adams loved to take people through Yosemite, um, and so this was a particularly memorable trip for him as he got to take artist Georgia O'Keeffe, Helen and Godfrey Rockefeller, and their cousin, uh, David McAlpin. Um, so it was a really uh, high-powered group of folks who was on this trip. They went in fairly luxurious style. Um, they had three or they had Four uh, associates who came with them who were in charge of setting up the camp and cooking and helping along the way. And they also had a string of pack mules um, to carry all of the gear and help set up the camp. But I learned yesterday that going up into these places with the pack mules at this time was not that rare of an occurrence, whereas today we would never really probably do that. They took a great route, a uh, pretty well known route through Yosemite to highlight a bunch of amazing spots. And Ansel Adams um, well, documented that in photographs. And then when he got home, he uh, created these albums uh, for the participants on the trip. So as far as we know, he created three albums uh, for this trip, one for O'Keefe, one for McAlpin, and one for the Rockefellers. And this copy that we have is from uh, David McAlpin. His grand niece, I think that's the right relationship, uh, Dean Dellenbach. Uh, convinced her to give us this album in the year 2000. Um, all of McAlpin's other stuff went to Princeton. There's a Princeton photography room at, Prin at Princeton. Um, but this one thing um, she felt would be great to have out west. And so we're very, very lucky to have it. We showed this exhibit uh, in 2003. It was the first time it was seen at this museum. And then it's been to a few other museums since then. Um, but we thought, given the centennial of the National Park Service and our other exhibits about Grand Teton and Yellowstone, that bringing this back out for everyone to see would be a really great opportunity. Um, we were also given permission in 2003 to print a catalog of the exhibit. Um, we were only given permission to print a thousand of these, um, and there are 90 of them left and available in the gift shop if anyone's interested in that. So it's a pretty rare item at this point. When we got permission to do it, they made me promise never to ask permission to reprint this again. <laughs> so I don't know that we'll ever be able to do it again. But this reproduces the album in the same size and same order as Ansel Adams put it together. Um, one other, or two other closing thoughts, and then we'll let Betsy speak. 
um, is that this album really shows a, a breadth of what Ansel Adams was known for. There are really fantastic landscape shots that many of you are familiar with. There's beautiful close-ups of different elements of nature. He liked to abstract or find abstract patterns in nature. So there's a couple beautiful tree trunks, wonderful mushroom photo. And then there's just some amazing, fun camp scenes that are probably most likely a little bit staged because he didn't have a super high power flash or a really fast camera like we have today. But they're really fun and they communicate some of the informal, casual, fun atmosphere of the, of the trip. Um, so it's really nice. It shows the range of his material. Um, and so it's, it's really worth uh, taking some time to look at it. One of the highlights of the trip, or one of the funny in-jokes that happened on the trip, was that at a certain point, Georgia O'Keeffe asked, what's the name of that mountain? And Ansel Adams said, oh, the Sierra Club has nominated that peak to be named after me. And so she teased him, apparently, for the whole rest of the time, saying, you just brought us up here to show us your little mountain. <laughs> um, he is not in any of the photos, because he was taking the photos, but there are four different images of Mount Ansel Adams, or what would become Mount so I think that was his way of inserting himself into the, into the album. So that's just a quick, brief overview, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Jane, who's going to introduce Betsy Grandy. Thanks, Ed. Sure. So Betsy Grandy is our special guest today, and she's a, a local who many of you may know as an excellent longtime fourth grade teacher with Teton County School District. What you may not know is that she was born and raised in Yosemite Valley, and she lived there for 25 years. She's worked for the Park Service and also at the Ansel Adams Gallery, which is still in Yosemite. Uh, her family and the family of Ansel Adams were longtime neighbors, co-workers, and friends, and you're going to get a really unique perspective from seeing and hearing through her, through her eyes. Thank you, Betsy. Apparently now there's only 89 in my title, so you can't have it back. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be here because I saw this display in 2003 with my mom, and I remember walking around that gallery over there looking at them and thinking, I've never seen these images before. So um, I did look at the Ansel Adams Gallery, which on, uh, on here is... Uh, Best Studios was his, um, his he married Virginia Best, and her family owned the gallery in Yosemite Valley. That's what it was called when he became, and later became called the Ansel Adams Gallery. Um, and we sold many, many of his fine prints and his prints, all, all of his prints, so I thought I had seen many of them, so I was very excited to come and see this this album that he had done. Um, so I've been coming across some journals lately, and um, I read the article in the magazine that the museum put out, and the paper, uh, the newspaper put out this week, and I came across a short blurb that I want to quote that says, um, as a boy, I remember taking my first trip to Yosemite with my parents driving up a long, twisty road called the Bay Oak Flat, which was narrow, with switchbacks, and it was wild, and it was one way, up in the morning and down in the evening. It was steep and tricky in those days, a few bridges, fording streams such as Yosemite Creek, and then taking an entire day to get into the high country. After being discharged from the Navy after World War II, I found myself with some extra time utilizing my GI Bill and starting a career. It seemed as good a time to any to leave my childhood home in the Bay Area and go exploring in California with friends, and Yosemite beckoned to us. We had swims in Emerald Pool, we climbed Half Dome, fished the Merced River, and let the majesty of these steep granite cliffs and waterfalls work their magic. Ironically, the ship I was on in the war was called the USS Caution. These mountains convinced me that I didn't intend to live my life that way. Before I knew it, I was completely absorbed by the high Sierras and began to ponder how I could get a job there. Well, from what I've read about 
Ansel Adams and the way that he ended up in Yosemite, I felt like these sentiments could have been his. But they're not. These are the sentiments of my father, both men born in San Francisco and pulled to Yosemite. This sentiment, this desire, this longing captured the hearts of so many in regard to Yosemite obviously including John Muir, who said, the mountains are calling me, and I must go. When the opportunity that my dad had hoped for as a young professional newly married, just graduated from San Francisco Dental School, didn't seem like really the lifestyle that was going to go with living in Yosemite. But fortunately for him, it was the beginning of the Korean War. And at the time, there was a full, Yosemite started out as a cavalry outpost. And so there was a full working medical and dental hospital in Yosemite Valley. And the dentist that was currently working there got called to the Korean War. And the head of staff at the Rose Memorial Hospital went to San Francisco and recruited my dad. That was 1950, and he, de and he dedicated 37 years of his life to the dental practice in Yosemite Valley. So he started in 1950 with a new wife, and by 1962, he adventured every weekend. It was pre-cell phone days. And he was on call because he was the only dentist. He was, the, he was on call 24-7 during the week. And he got away on the weekends, disconnected the phone. We got away on the weekends. We were doing something every weekend. By 1962, he had four of us kids ranging in 11 to 2. And we were adventuring all the time. He would pack us all. He would pack us all from 11 to 2 on the back of and we would take um, weekend hikes up into places like Washburn Lake, Merced Lake, um, Bogle Sand Camp, 12 Wee Meadows, anywhere that we could go. He would take us, and my mom just packed up the kids, and we went. When, we, when my dad started approaching the end of his life at 91, he could no longer get to the places where we had all settled and raised our families. Because growing up in Yosemite is a lifestyle. It's, it's in your blood. And it's, my oldest brother became a ranger on the Mula Bus and raised his family on Lake Champlain in Vermont. My sister was a ranger in the Tetons in the summer and to Wallaby Meadows in Yosemite in the winter. Um, I have a brother in Summit County, Colorado, and my husband and I raised our boys here in Jackson Hole. And my dad said, I love to visit all the places you've been, but I can't do it anymore. But I guess I only have myself to blame for that since um, I instilled this love of nature in you. So, what was it like growing up in Yosemite? I, I'm reminded as I look around this room that um, there really is an exclusive beauty to Yosemite and people appreciate it. Ansel Adams' pictures are world famous, but this display just goes to show that even he must have realized that photographs can come close, but experience Yosemite, experiencing Yosemite is just something that a photograph can never catch. Um, the euphoria of witnessing, you know, just this creation, these monolithic mountains and waterfalls, and um, as my husband likes to remind me, he said, when in, in the spring, I remember not being able to sleep at your parents' house because the windows were shaking from the waterfalls all the time. 
it was a lot different, as as you will see from these photographs. Um, when I expect when I express my childhood memories of people, a lot of people say to me, "Well, you certainly couldn't do that now. You couldn't do this now. Um, you couldn't just go to a friend like Bob Barnett, who was one of the associates and a wrangler wrangle at the park concession um, stables, and just say, I'd like to take my friends and my dignitaries up into the backcountry and, and do that. Um, for instance, we used to do things like flood a parking lot. I mean, the, the concessioner used to flood a parking lot over in Camp Curry Village and just flood it. We called it the apple orchard because that's what it used to be. And they would flood it when the nights were frozen, and that's what we would skate on all the time. We would take our skates with us everywhere we went. We could skate on Mirror Lake. We could, we could still get into the backcountry on some of these roads. We would drive up and skate on Snapbrook Lake or um, Saddlebag Lakes and Tioga Lakes. And, and it was just, we were just able to, to do that. Later on, the park concessioner added a, an ice skating rink and started opening it up to the public. And we still hung out there, but it was it was not the just let's grab our skates and go skating on the on the river. Um, now it has completely evolved into part of the government master plan has completely taken out any of those activities at all. There is no longer an ice rink in Yosemite Valley. Um, can't rent bicycles and you know it's going through some political changes but I don't remember ever really really thinking about that. Um, we we would not we, we always, I remember my brothers always saying swimming pools are for paying guests. <laughs> uh, swimming holes were for Yosemite locals. And we used to hang out at the river wherever we wanted, whenever we wanted. Um, we had secret beaches. We knew, but we, uh, some of them we, only the locals knew the paths in and out. And most days they were deserted. We would go down to the curry company garage and ask some of the mechanics in there, yeah, the old inner tubes, and they would patch them up enough for us to get down the river and we'd go. Again, the concessioner came in and um, started started thinking, that's a really good idea. We need to start renting those rafts. And it became easier and easier to find all the secret places that we used to go to as kids. And now that's another um, item that's been been taken away from the, from the locals. Um, one of my favorite pictures in this display is this one of a different angle of Half Dome. My dad mentions in his notes that he and his friends used to climb Half Dome, and I remember, I mean, if you've ever been to Yosemite Valley, Half Dome stands like this big guardian monolith at the front of the valley. It's all you can see from practically anywhere in the valley. Um, it's the subject of many, many tales from the Awanichi tribe, and it's just it's just a beautiful single piece of granite. My dad first took me climbing it when I was seven years old. We took a day into Little Yosemite, and then a day to bushwhack to the base of the cable ladder that led up to the top. It was late summer, all the tourists were gone, and we were the only people we saw that day. And from the top, you could see the entire valley. We, picked, we picnicked, pointed out each house of the people we knew, which at that time was everybody. <laughs> when you look at the half dome, it's about up here, and you can see where it says Yosemite Valley Government Housing, and they had all the other housing complex that you could see from the top. Well, over the years, not too long after we, we had done that, probably when I was about 15 or 16, too many people were going into the wilderness and nobody knew where they were. So they, the um, National Park Service needed to keep track of those people, and they started 
issuing wilderness permits and rangers deployed to check them. Half Dome, of course, in Little Yosemite became some of the most popular destinations. And so we always waited until the off season to go when wilderness passes weren't necessarily needed and the crowds had died down. Now, if you've read any of the papers recently, climbing Half Dome has become so popular, it's on a lottery system. <laughs> Park visitors can no longer count on the once in a lifetime experience of a breathtaking view without a, a lot of proper planning. You have to plan years in advance if you want to go go for the lottery to climb Half Dome. And I just I just think back to we used to just kind of say, oh, let's go, let's go into the backcountry, or let's climb Half Dome, or let's go to the top of Nevada Falls, or let's walk to the top of Yosemite Falls, or the things that we used to do, we just didn't even really think about them. We didn't have to think about them. We just did them. Uh, we, like I said, we spent every weekend <coughs> packing our large family. <coughs> in and out of places like Mobile Saint or Sid Lake. And we had sailing regattas. Local, anybody the locals that had sails, sailboats would take them on Tanaya Lake. Um, we had a local ski resort, Badger Pass. Like I said, skating on wa a watered down parking lot. It's a skating, skating rink. And spontaneously taking guests into the high Sierras were not things that we gave much thought to weren't planned months or weeks or even years in advance. They were just things that we did. Doing this either now is either non-existent or so heavily burdened by regulations that it's really takes a lot of planning. As part of the Yosemite Rite of Passage, local kids were would begin working summer months for the park concessioners at age 14. If you think about it, we had housing. They knew our parents, so you didn't play hooky for a film a job where somebody knew your parents. And we were available on weekends and during breaks. So our parents knew all the proprietors, and I started working for the Adams family at the Ansel Adams Galleries in the summer of 1977. And I worked there for three years. By then, he, uh, Ansel and Virginia were living full time in Carmel and they kept just a little family home in Yosemite behind the Ansel Adams Gallery for special occasions. And I remember we would close up the gallery at night and he would not even know that the Adams were in town. And all of a sudden we'd be back in the back of the store and we'd see that the red light over Ansel's dark room was on. And we would know that he was in town. So we would wait around and kill our time and know that wait till he came out, he was going to show us something pretty spectacular that was new, new photos, new things we hadn't seen before. So that was always really exciting. And going full circles on, on this, Ansel Adams died in 1984, but you still look at his images that he took in 1938 around this room, you look at images that he took up until the time he died, and they just continue to enchant us. Uh, his legacy lives on in the Yosemite Mountains, and Mount Ansel Adams was officially dedicated to him in a ceremony in 1985 on the anniversary of his, of his death. Um, it drew a lot of celebrities, a lot of government dignitaries. But some of the celebrities that came were David Brower, um, Wallace Stegner, and my personal favorite, Robert Redford, gave a talk, <laughs> and a lot of government and dignitaries, uh, the head of the Department of the Interior, um, Alan Simpson, and, and um, there were just there were just a lot of people that had a lot of respect for him in a lot of in a lot of high areas, and. This is the way that I, as a local, would prefer to remember Yosemite as being able to be taken in these pictures, uh, the way that this map looks. Um, Jane was asking me how often do you 
can go back and have to admit it. it's just not the same. It is one of those places where it's where it's really hard to go back. I try to go back at least once a year, it once a year, but we end up in the High Sierra camps near Tenaya Lake, coming up from the backside near 395 and coming in that direction. But um, it's just one of those places that your childhood makes you think of things differently than they would probably seem to you as an adult. This is the perfect time if you have questions for either Betsy or for Adam. They can answer questions, um, and then we will break after that. How did, how did Yosemite come by its name, and when did it become a national park? I don't know how it came by its name. Yosemite was, was um, actually um, I'm not sure exactly the name, but growing, I mean, exactly the date that Yosemite became a um, national park. It was a military base, and John Muir was there, and he, he fought and fought and fought and went to Washington and petitioned Theodore Roosevelt to protect it. And he was not, he, that there was no such thing as the national park system at the time. It was a it was a cavalry base, and so it first became was I consider it because I grew up there. I consider it America's first national park, but it uh, it would it first became a California state park, and then he and then uh, Teddy Roosevelt did Yellowstone and Redwood Sequoia, and then they were able to get Yosemite. Um, the Yosemite, the Yosemite as a national park, but it was a California state park before it was a national park. So if you think about the, it was run by the U.S. Army first because there was no entity as the National Park Service. So I don't know whether this is a 100th anniversary of the National Park Service or a 100th anniversary of, so it would have been so, over 100 years ago. Yeah, this is the anniversary of the Park Service. So some of these parks, a lot of them came into existence before the Park Service was formed. And yeah, Yosemite predates Yellowstone in terms of being a protected entity. So first it was given to the state, then Yellowstone became the first national park, then Yosemite became a national park after that. So it would have been protected first before 1872, and then becoming a park sometimes, sometime after 1872. I just looked it up, and it's October 1st, 1890. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to see you. Yeah. Other questions for either Adam or for Betsy? Does anybody know who these Rockefellers are? I mean, we think of the Rockefellers as the Tetons, and Godfrey Rockefeller does not ring a bell. Who is he in relationship to John D? And All right, let me see. They are, they are a lot of, the same family. Yeah, they're they're the same family. Um, so, McAlphin was grandson of William Rockefeller and grandnephew of John D. Rockefeller. So, I, I mean, a lot of the family comes down from John D. Rockefeller. Um, but then I think the um, Lawrence Rockefeller, who was prominent here, is a different branch of the family. But, but same family. But right, same, same family. family. And then. Uh, uh, Godfrey Rockefeller was the first cousin of David McAlpin. Okay. And yep. those two were on this trip. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Could you explain the uh, fireball? <laughs> That's my husband. I was going to ask about the fireball. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the fireball is pretty, it was pretty amazing. We also used to feed bears in the dump there, so I kind of left some of that part out, especially with all the accidents happening in Yellowstone. I thought that's probably not a good idea to talk about. But every night during the summer on Glacier Point, right here, which sits at the top, at the, on the rim of Yosemite Valley, they used to build a um, they used to build a huge bonfire, and someone down in Curry Village would would call up and say Glacier Point, and they would say 
we're ready. And they would say, well, then let the fire fall. And they would push this great big bonfire over the side. And it looked like a waterfall <laughs> made out of fire. And it would come, and it would just come sprinkling down to the valley. And um, I can't believe they did it. But it, was <laughs> it, was, it was pretty cool. Uh, then they started down to just once a week, and then it just got to be too much of a, um, I guess, I don't know. It's not very natural. So, <laughs> so they don't do it anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can't see why. But we used, I remember we used to go out, in the, and it was always in the summer. We used to go out in the summer and sit on our back wood pile, and, you know, the, the, it was so... The, the walls of Yosemite are so high that you could hear them miles away saying, let the fire fall, and then over it would come. It's pretty, it's a pretty amazing sight. Uh, I guess what's your favorite memory of Yosemite? <laughs> it's, it, uh, I, I would really have to say, uh, as a fourth grade teacher, I, I teach 10 year olds. I remember, I just remember that we used to just walk out of the house in the morning. Um, all of the parents had a certain whistle. My mom had a long blast and we were supposed to come home and other people had um, like two short blasts. And other than that, we just used to leave in the morning and we wouldn't come back until dinner time. And I remember there was a small creek behind our house that in, that came off of Yosemite Falls, that when that would flow, we would go down and we would just throw stuff in the creek, and then we would run down there and watch where it came out. And um, later on, when we were able to take, when they had a shuttle bus system in the valley, we would just ride the shuttle buses and get off and walk up to the waterfalls and seeing the wildlife and just, just being in that natural setting all the time. And not having the commitments of school and we didn't, uh, you know, the commitments of sports and dance. I mean, it was just all we did all day long was just play. And um, I just remember that all the time, fishing and things that you just, that now you just, you, you really have to think about them before you do them. Michelle? I wanted to ask, what is your favorite memory of Ansley Adams? I I do think it was when, because he was, uh, you know, you think of him as this great man, but he was just this humble, little, almost Santa Claus looking person. And I remember him when he would sneak in and out of the back, when he would sneak in and out of the, the dark room, it was just like almost some, you know, if we caught him, it was almost like we had caught him doing something wrong. And he would just laugh and and just giggle and say, let me show you what's what's going on in here. Um, that's, yeah. Okay. Well, yes, one more back there. Will you be able to say hello to the sun? I will not. Um, I have talked to him via email, um, and I know that he and his wife are both going to be here. He, um, yeah, he, I'm going to be out of town. I get out of school in a week, and I have some family commitments in California that I have to do. He's coming while I'm gone. But I have seen him in, uh, in a few recent years here. When he and his wife have been here, I guess they have some pretty close friends here. And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, Michael Adams, who's um, the eldest child of Ansel Adams, his son, will be here June 21st and 22nd. There's a public program on the 21st at the, up at the Craig Thomas Visitor Center in Grand Teton Park. It is sold out. However, if you are interested, you can show up that night at 6.30. And there will, we will start a wait list at that point because we anticipate, even though it is, it's a free ticketed event, so we had to ticket it to because we knew that it would be popular. But we anticipate there will be a few people probably who won't show on that evening. So if you're really interested and are willing to wait and see, come on up to the Craig Thomas Visitor Center on June 21st by 6.30.
correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any final questions? Well, enjoy the exhibit. Um, please remember that we have a special discount for lunch. If you want to go into the Rising Sage Cafe and identify yourself as a program attendee, they will give you a 20% discount on your lunch today. And thank you both to Betsy and to Adam.